in this chapter, the scriptures we're going to look at today, John chapter 7, Jesus is ridiculed by his brothers. That's not very nice to make fun or be made fun of. And then later on, we're going to see how there are people who hate Jesus and want to kill him. They're looking for him. And again, not very fun. So Jesus is, on the one hand, an object of fun. And for others, he's somebody they've got to get rid of. And you ask, why, why is this? Why are people feel like they can act like this toward Jesus? And the answer is, is because Jesus' main motive in his life is completely opposite to everybody around him. Everybody else is going in this direction, and Jesus is moving in an, an exactly opposite direction about the most important things in his life. And, you know, people worship and serve themselves and seek their own glory. But Jesus is not seeking his own glory. Now you'd think, who cares? But it brings him into conflict with people around him. And so, we're going to look at this and just consider for ourselves which direction are we going? What is the direction of our lives? And there are certain things we need to expect if we're going to live for the glory of God. We're going to see these things. So, I'm reading in John chapter 7. And it says there, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I'm not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things, to them he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, He is good. Others said, No, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. And that's where we leave it. So, as we begin the chapter, John sets the time, the place, for us it's about six months after chapter 6. The last chapter was around the time of Passover, which is around April. And the Feast of Tabernacles is around mid-October. 
And what we see here is that Jesus' brothers really don't believe that he's the Messiah, and they're making fun of him a little bit here. And they're saying, why don't you go up to Judea? Because that's where the big cities are, and that's where the action is, and you're trying to be somebody. So why don't you go where there's the people that count, and why don't you impress them? Because you're hanging around Galilee, and this is the sticks. This is the country. And you're not going to get anywhere as you minister to one person at a time. Don't you think you could stop being so backward and just get out there and go for people's attention and try to make something out of yourself? They're trying to help him out. You know, Jesus, he's not really so good in the PR department here. Why don't you get out there and, and, and make something out of yourself? <laughs> you know, kind of being a little snarky there. And you know, Jesus comes back in a way that makes you sort of scratch your head and go, what? Is he, is he trying to insult us? Is, what, it, what was that? But he says, my time has not yet come. Now, when he talks about my time in John, he's talking about that time when he's going to serve the Father, when he's going to glorify the Father. And he's talking about when he's going to die on the cross. That's his time. And you know, says here he didn't want to walk around in Judea because the Jews are trying to kill him. So I wonder if his brothers really understood that if he shows up in Judea, he's risking his life. Don't know. But, you know, this idea of Jesus giving himself and allowing himself to be crucified, this is going to serve every person who has ever lived. This is going to change the course of the world. This is going to change how we date the millennia. This is momentous, right? He says, my time has not yet come. There's a time when this needs to happen. But in contrast, in comparison, he says, your time is always here. Isn't that interesting? Your guys, your time is always here. What are they going to do? Well, what's the opposite of something eternal? That's temporary. What's the opposite of significant? Well, insignificant. Jesus has a time and a work to do, and these guys aren't really doing anything at all. You can kick around, and it's cool. And he actually goes on to say, the world can't hate you. Isn't that a funny way to put it? You guys are unhateable. <laughs> Nobody could look at you and say, well, that's despicable. All they'd do is look at you and say, well, hey, you're one of us. Thumbs up, man. Hang loose, be cool, whatever. The world can't hate you. Why? Because you're one of them. And you're going in the same direction. Everything's groovy in the herd. We're just eat, drink, and tomorrow we die. And What are you doing? I don't know. What are you doing? Well, let's do it together. Okay, cool. So everybody is kind of doing their own thing, kind of going this direction. And the world looks on and says, you're one of us, man. Can't hate you. Love ya. And in fact, that's exactly what Jesus says later on in John chapter 15. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love you. Because the world loves its own. So, you're doing the right thing. But he says, the world hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. Now, you know, we never catch Jesus running around 
pointing at somebody and saying, I testify, your deeds are evil. He has never said that. So he's not like church cop showing up, putting on the white glove. Ah, uh huh. Your deeds are evil. Who wants this guy around? But you see, he testifies of it that its deeds are evil. How? By his example. See, the world is off kind of doing its own thing and living for themselves. We're going to see this in greater detail later on. But Jesus is living a completely opposite way. He says, my times are from the Father. I am looking for the Father's glory. And just by doing that, people can tell this guy is not going our direction. And you know what it is? Like when you see a whole bunch of people coming, Let's say you're in the tube somewhere and here come a whole herd of commuters and they take up the entire corridor down there. And now you're thinking, how am I going to pass through here? I'm trying to go this way and the entire wall of people is going this way. There's a conflict. Which side do I get on? Well, they decided every side is our side. You can have what's left. Well, this is Jesus. The entire world is coming to him and he's saying, no, I'm going my direction. I am going to glorify the Father. So he says, you know what? You guys are always on. It's always your time. It's not my time yet. You go up without me. But then he turns around and goes up anyway. So why is he going up? And there's two reasons. The first reason is it's the will of God. It's written in the law. Three times a year, every Jewish male is to appear before God in the place where God sets his name. And Jesus loves the will of God. So he's going to do that. But the second reason that Jesus does that is that it's the will of God. It's the will of God to draw people to Jesus. He gives people to Jesus. He speaks to them. He teaches them. He draws them to Jesus. It's the will of the Father. And so because it's the will of the Father, Jesus is going to do the will of the Father and go to a place where it's going to risk his life to do it. But he doesn't have to travel with people who don't appreciate what he's doing. So he says, you guys go up by yourself. I'm not going up now. So he goes later and comes probably in the middle of the feast. Now, it's a seven-day feast. So if, you know, Wednesday, the middle of the feast, Jesus shows up and it's it's very, how would you say, excited. Because you've got, in verse 11, you've got the Jewish leaders looking for him. And the language there says they're continually looking for him. They're on the outlook. They got guys looking for Jesus. Continually. And they're continually asking, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? So, they're looking to kill him. And they got a, the people much complaining about him. Some people are defending him, saying he's doing a good thing. He's healing people. What's the matter with that? And then there's other people who say, no, he deceives the people. And you got to think, now, where do they get that? Have they seen the miracles? Have they followed Jesus? These are the kind of guys that are experts straight from the internet. And they say, nope, that's not how it works. I know for sure that's a conspiracy or whatever it is. 
They don't know what they're talking about, but they come out with their opinion anyway, because that's me. That's who I am. I see these things. The guy's a fake. Believe me when I say that. Okay, fine, but they can't say anything because it's getting kind of tough to talk about Jesus. And everybody's afraid of what's going to happen. Now, the Jewish leaders are, are using their authority and their power to kind of herd the people and keep them from getting out of line. And the issue is their authority. This party of Jewish leaders have been the interpreters of the Word of God for the last hundred years. Even their enemies are forced to go along with their interpretation. So they have authority and they have power. And Jesus is a threat to their position. Okay? So Jesus is a separate authority figure. That threatens not only their authority, but their prestige. And so they're not really happy about this. That's why they hate him. You know, later on in the Gospels, it says, Pilate knew that the Jewish leaders handed Jesus over to him because of envy. They weren't looking out for the Roman government, their own government, nothing. They envied him and they wanted to get rid of him. So in the midst of all this, among the people, but they can't talk about it. The Jewish leaders are going, where is he? Where is he? He actually gets up right in the middle of the temple, public, and begins to teach. Now, for myself, I admire that kind of personal courage, stability, where you get up and you realize everybody is polarized about you. And there's a bunch of guys that would kill you right now if they could get to you without causing a riot. And he gets up and he begins teaching. I just think that's amazing. He is trusting his Heavenly Father that it's not time yet. And as long as it's not time, you can risk your life and do what the Father is telling you to do. That's what Jesus is doing. And I want you to think about this for a minute. Serving the Father is true worship. Worship, serving God, they are two sides of the same coin. They mean the same thing. We have a modern definition of worship that is almost exclusively musical. And it's a time when there's a group playing and you're singing the songs and, you know, you're into it completely. And as far as it goes, that's fine. There's no problem with that. The only problem is, is when the, the mentality says that is worship alone. It's when we're singing songs to glorify God. But that's not Jesus' position. See, Jesus is offering his entire body to God. And he's serving God, even at the risk of his own life. And you know, it will cost him his whole life. Think about Jesus hanging on the cross. That is the greatest service to God. That is the greatest worship of God. And there's no music. But it's complete and acceptable worship to God. That's what worship is. It's 24 hours serving God and seeking His glory. So here's Jesus. 
standing in the temple by himself, teaching at the risk of his life. And the Jewish leaders are marveling. They're amazed. They're in verse 15. How does this man know letters having never studied? Now, they're not saying that Jesus is some kind of a prodigy. You know, like he, he knows everything and he never went to school. What they're saying is, is who does he think he is getting up there and telling us anything? They are offended at Jesus. And the reason is, he never went to their schools. He's not teaching like the other guys teach. And you remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, that the people were astonished at the way Jesus taught because he taught with authority, not as the scribes. The kind of teaching that you'd get now in a rabbinical school in Jesus' time is you learn what the rabbis have said. And when you teach, you can bring out the various opinions. Rabbi so-and-so said this, but Rabbi so-and-so said that. And you have to balance it with what the master here said. And so they can reel off a list of all the opinions and the fathers saying this, but you can never equal the fathers. They're it. They're everything. Their interpretation is so important. So all I'm going to tell you is what they have said. That's how the scribes teach. But Jesus gets up and says, you know what? You've heard it said, so and so and so, but I say to you. And that's as good as, thus says the Lord. And Jesus isn't presenting even his own opinion. He's speaking with authority. And the Jewish leaders, they, were, they get that. They're going, he's not quoting any rabbi. He didn't mention rabbi anybody, not even once. And what they're basically saying is, who does he think he is? Where is he getting his authority to get up and say the things that he's saying? We didn't accredit him. He did not pass our school so that we give him the authority to do this. This guy's on his own. Who in the world does he think he is to be lecturing us? It amazes the people, but it, these guys say, man, he's not with us. And then in verse 16, isn't it interesting that Jesus answers them? Now, you know, he knows what these guys are thinking and discussing among themselves without a delegation going to him and saying, well, you know what, we don't like what you're teaching because you didn't go to our school, so where's your authority? Nobody's talked to him, but he knows. This is the interesting thing about Jesus. Everything, you know, we keep secret from everybody else that they don't know. Jesus already knows. He can address our lives even right now today. And we've never told him a thing. He's doing it right now in public. And this is the issue. He says, my doctrine is not mine, but it's him who sent me. He's the one that told me what to speak. Again, he's saying, thus says the Lord. And he's saying, I'm not putting myself forward. I'm not trying to establish my authority. 
But I am saying this is on the authority of God. This is because God gave me these words. The Father is my authority because he sent me. And I'm speaking these things because the Father told me to. Now, how do we know that what Jesus teaches is not him? That when he speaks, it's God the Father speaking. Why do we have to pay attention to him? Because our lives depend on everything that he says. He's got a way that shows us. You know, either Jesus is being arrogant to the nth degree, or he's a complete liar, or else that everything he says is the word of God and it's true. Either he's completely stuck up or he's lying and he knows it's not true or else what he says is true. And he has a way for everybody to find out. So he says, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. And that means to know by experience. Not this intuitive kind of, I have a feeling, my feeling says he's true. He says, no, you're going to know by experience that everything I'm seeing is from God. And I find it so interesting because what it means is Jesus is not on trial. And he has to prove his authority. Well, I, I got my card right here. I can, I can show you. See how it's signed right there? God? That's, this is my license. So take a good look. There. Wow, that was pretty good. We can't top that. Okay. No, he says, if anyone is willing to do his will, that's completely different, don't you think? That throws the test on you. That means you have to discern that it's God talking to you and you know it's God. What is it when you're willing? It means you're already submitted to God. God has spoken. I believe it's God. I'm going to do it because I fear God. Because I worship God. Because I seek his glory. And if you're used to submitting yourself to God, then you already know what it's like to submit to the word of God. It's not a new thing for you. It is a continuing of what you've already done. So, everyone who seeks the glory of God is going to know this is exactly the same thing. Jesus isn't seeking his own glory. He's seeking the glory of the Father. I can tell. This is how you act when you seek the glory of God. When you submit yourself. When you fear God greatly. And if you're not willing to do what God says, that means you're doing your own thing. Right? And that means you're living on a completely different, in a, in a, in a different direction. Because if there's no God to please, who's next in line? Well, me. I want to please me. And I, I want to seek my own glory. And that's what everybody's doing. So, I'm not going to acknowledge what Jesus says to be true because that's against where I'm going. If I submit to Jesus, I've got to submit to God. I don't want to do that. I'm out for me. 
So somebody who's not willing to obey God is not going to know if Jesus is from God. And if I don't know if he's from God, I'm not going to follow him. See, it gets you right off the hook. I don't know where this guy is from. Why should I follow any guy? I don't know where he's from. Are you kidding? I'm not stupid. All right. Because if I have to obey Jesus, man, that means I have to lose my authority. I can't say what happens in my life. He says what happens in my life. It means I can't live for my own glory. I'm going to have to do what he says. Forget that. So here's the real issue here. Jesus, with his whole life, is seeking the glory of the Father. And because he's doing that, his brothers are making fun of him, and the Jewish leaders hate him and want to kill him. That's where the conflict is coming from, from all those who are seeking their own glory. So here's the principle that Jesus lives by. Seek the glory that comes from the Father. Because he says that. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true. And no unrighteousness is in him. So he's saying, I am seeking the glory of the Father. That's true. And there is no sin in me. No rebellion against that glory of God. God is in the highest place. I want him there. There's no sin in me. I am true. Now, if you're not seeking the glory of the Father, then you are not true. You're believing a lie. And you're testifying to a lie. That is, I'm not going to live for God, His glory. I'm living for my glory. I'm living as though there is no God. I'm testifying there is no God. And basically, I am denying that there is a God. Now that's insulting to God, don't you think? He should receive the glory. He made everything. He made me. Therefore, I should glorify God. That's what you do with your Creator. That's right. If I don't do that, then I'm glorifying myself and I automatically dishonor God. And I'm not doing anything different than what the devil does. Because the devil glorifies himself and dishonors God. Me and the devil, and everybody in the whole world is going away from God. And the world can't hate you, because we're all going in the same direction. These are the people who give awards to everybody. You win the BAFTA awards, or the Oscar, or the Emmy, and we get all these awards, and we just say, I just want to thank everybody who voted for me, and I just want to thank my producers and my writers and all the little people who worship me. Thank you for making me God. You know? And this award is so precious to me. Because you all guys think I'm something. And really, I'm a, an alcoholic drug addict. And my life is going right into the toilet because I don't even ha know how to live. And I'm on my fifth divorce. But you guys think I'm fabulous, so thank you. So we give each other awards, and we win all these awards, and we all think we're fabulous. But so what? Temporary. Insignificant. Useless. It's all dishonoring to the Father. Because, you know, everything that you are comes from God, and he holds your life breath in his hands, and you've not glorified him. 
But let's say you're going the other way. Let's see, say that you're seeking the glory of the one true living God. The opposite direction. Then you've got to prepare yourself for a few consequences. You're going to have to be prepared to be misunderstood by your family who are going to think you are not normal because you're nothing like them. Have you ever felt this conflict in your family? See, your very actions testify against them that their deeds are evil. And you've never said, Dad, your deeds are evil. But your dad is a little bit irritated anyway. What did I do? Well, you're living for the glory of God. And what that says is, he's wrong. Saying to your mom, she's wrong. Your brothers and sisters are making fun of you because they get this impression, oh, you think I'm wrong, do you? Well, Christian, <laughs> you get that reaction. It's kind of like, what did I do? You know, I'm just following Jesus. But your life tells everybody they're wrong. They're living for so low a goal. And you're living for the highest goal. You're not trying to be a snob. You're not walking around pointing your finger like it's fun. You just... I just want to go to church. That's not normal. And think about it for a second. You will not become like them, but they may become like you. And think about this as a possibility because none of Jesus' half-brothers believed in him. But did you know that in the upper room after Jesus was raised from the dead, all of his brothers were there, and his mother. And James and Jude actually wrote part of the New Testament. Can you imagine? So, don't become like them, but they may become like you. There's hope. In the meantime, live for the glory of God and prepare to be misunderstood by your family. Then you gotta have you gotta prepare to have your authority challenged. That is, you believe in Jesus, and people will say, Oh well, you know, the Bible, all it is is just what men have said, and it's passed down in oral tradition until it's nothing but Chinese whispers, and you believe in fairy tales. And of course, you challenge them on their authority and they say, well, Stephen Hawking said it. That's good, you know. Um, Richard Dawkins says it. Oh, that's, that's heavy. A guy with two lungs full of air in him said something. So we should all fall down. Because Richard said it and he's really snarky, so we have to take what he says. Say, nope, that's, that's not good enough authority. Well, we are bucking our whole culture and what people have said for centuries, this is normal. And if you do this, we'll call you normal. And if you go this direction, then we're going to call you a weirdo and we're going to make laws against you and we're going to strip you of your rights and we're going to take your job away from you. You gotta prepare to have your authority challenged. And then you have to prepare to be ridiculed and despised for no good reason other than you are living for the glory of God. So you might be taken to court so that everybody else is gonna be afraid to open their mouth and not say anything about Jesus because this doctor lost his job and this teacher lost her job and this guy said something on Facebook 10 years ago so now he's sacked. But see, we have to be, 
we have to prepare to lose our jobs and lose everything and even get killed. You have to prepare for that in advance because, first of all, we're entering into the fellowship of the suffering of Jesus. It's no different from him. He's the son of God and his brothers were snickering at him. Hey, Jesus, you got this being somebody thing backward. We're here to wise you up. And then hostility from these Jewish leaders. Why? Not because anything I'm saying is wrong. Is I didn't graduate from your university. See, that's why we hate you. Well, he endured hostility from sinners against himself. So you will too. But then as you endure the sufferings of Christ, you know you're also going to receive his glory. Because that's what we're living for, right? The glory of God. And as we seek after that glory and worship the Father, we're going to receive that glory. That's the end of our lives. That's where we're headed. We don't expect to be buried and that's the end of it, turned to dust. Kind of a nice person, but mostly wacky. No, we're going to stand before God and he says, well done. Here's immortality. And here is eternal glory and honor. So, here's what we think about. Do we worry about momentary ridicule? Momentary suffering? And people saying, you're not right. It's a bunch of fairy tales. The Bible isn't true. You have no authority. You don't take that on board and say, well, I better say nothing then and just go to church. That's, that's the extent of my worship. I'm going to stay in my little church shoebox and never say anything in the real world. But in the box, we believe that it's real. But out here... We don't. We're going to live the truth at church and we're going to live the truth at home. We're going to live the truth on our job and at the grocery store and driving our car and everywhere. We're going to do that because that's where we're headed, to the glory of God. We're going to do everything we do to his glory, which means we speak the truth in love, we care for people, we love them, we tell them the truth. We live right. And when people say, oh, you're a nice person, actually, Jesus saved me. I'm not such a nice person. He's glorious. He's worth knowing. He saves people. He saved me. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to worship Him. Everybody get that? Let's pray. Thank you, <laughs> Heavenly Father, for this salvation that you give us that it leads directly to this glory. And we notice that even for your son, God himself, it's humility now, glory afterward. We notice he, he was not glorified on the earth. He glorified you. And that's what our lives are about. And there might be some of us here who aren't there yet. We haven't decided, okay, I'm going to glorify God with my life. Help them to see the emptiness and the futility 
of just living for oneself. For the rest of us, we pray not to fear any man, but to fear you and to give you glory, to worship you and to serve you. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see.